Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. Today we're going to be discussing a disgusting subject, but it's something that needs to be addressed, particularly in the summertime, as we go to various uh, lakes and things like that to swim, and that is worms and parasites. Now, when we're talking about what's a difference between something that's a beneficial bacteria or beneficial microorganism versus a non-beneficial. Now, parasites and worms in the context that I'm using are things that are non-beneficial that interfere with the body's normal activities and functions. Now, the best way to diagnose these, and actually the best way to know, is you will have the runs. You will have, look at all these uh, symptoms that I've listed here. Now, these can be a lot of different things, but the biggest thing you're going to usually see with the types of bacteria we get, like from food or from water, is going to be these particular. You're going to get fever and chills, maybe a little bit of hives. Um, now, parasites can collect in all areas of the body. The most common ones, however, are in our gut. When we, go, when we go traveling outside the country, or we go to a different town, or we don't adequately wash our produce, um, we're going to end up with these little buggies and little microorganisms. Now, they come in all shapes, sizes, and forms, and you can go online and look at them and get all grossed out, or you can watch, there are some TV um, specials on parasites that I've had the opportunity to watch. Even the show called House uh, discussed a parasite that's transferred from raccoon feces to the brain if, when children get a hold of it when they're playing in areas. Um, so it can come in all different shapes and sizes, or they can. Um, but mainly from contaminated food or water or something that you ingest into your mouth. With children, oftentimes it'll be dog or kitty feces or all kinds of things, dirt. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we'd be, be fanatical because obviously even Louis Pasteur said that germs are necessary in order to build our immune system. It's just when our immune system gets weakened, then we can't fight these kinds of things off. So just as a side note, if you do tend to get food poisoning easy and those types of things, that usually means you have a weakened immune system and that your gut flora or your good microorganisms are at too low of a level. So it allows these not so good microorganisms to take over and cause you injury and damage. Um, it's kind of funny when you look at this because um, what parasites can do is they can cause an initial immediate response, you know, like I was mentioning the diarrhea or things like that. But, or they can sit on an area of the body and you can develop a disease or a disorder. They can settle in the brain. They can settle all over the body. So, obviously keeping the immune system in good functioning order. Now, one of the things I ran across on research is a major contributing factor towards causing uh, this is going to be the diet and the really heavy ingestion of sugar. I know Ralph has talked about and will continue to talk about the amount of sugar that the American population eats and that really causes our immune system to drop. In addition, it feeds these little things. So next time you're grabbing your soda with your chips and uh, junk, hey, you better be thinking about that because what that does is that feeds these microorganisms and decreases your immune system so you can't properly respond to these or other bacterial or viral or fungal infections as well. So as far as prevention is concerned, and as they say, a pound of cure, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Eating fresh garlic, ginger, onions, you don't think in terms of onions being, but they're very antimicrobial, antimicrobial. Uh, raw pumpkin seeds, papaya, if I learned to spell it, papaya juice, and you're thinking papaya juice, it has enzymes in there that literally will digest these things away. So enzyme-rich foods, foods such as your fruits and vegetables, your non-processed items, as long as they're well washed, which you should always do, you know, you wash them, um, will always help the immune system and help you fight off parasites. Now, when I say sugar, I just don't mean pure sugar. I'm talking about white flour, pastas, you know the junk food. The junk food and the studies that were done years back basically stated that one teaspoon of sugar or its equivalent will lower your immune system for four to six hours. So all you big soda drinkers and junky junkers, you can think about all the bugs that are crawling around in your body because if the immune system is down, they're there. It's not if they're there, they're there. So keeping the immune system is up.
kind of gross to think that you got these kind of things crawling around you. But they're there if you're not taking care of yourself. Now, um, I want to talk also too, just a little focus on, I, I touched upon it on the diagnostics. Now, there are stool analysis that can be run, but they need to be done by um, labs that specialize in parasite detection because 50% success rate on bowel testings for parasites and it drops substantially if your doctor's just sending it off to a regular lab. These types of labs specialize in looking for various forms of parasites and diagnostics. Blood tests also indicate certain forms of parasites as well. Certain uh, proteins and other things will show up when you have certain types of parasites. So these are the two diagnostic tools that your doctor should utilize focusing on making sure it gets to the right kind of lab. And you need to say that to your doc. If, you've got, if you think you've got parasites and he thinks you do as well, doc is the lab that you're using, double check and make sure that they have the ability to properly diagnose this. Your standard labs do not. Now besides focusing on a good immune system stimulating diet, there are supplements out there that have been used for centuries. Now, there are medications out there to fight parasites, but I'm going to tell you right now, they will take you down so fast, so quick, and so hard. If you have an opportunity to look for natural alternative means, you would best be served by doing that. I personally um, had parasites really heavily entrenched at one time. I had mercury poisoning, candida yeast. My diet was much different, and I'll tell you, I had to do the majority of these things on here to fight and conquer it and get it gone. Not a pleasant experience. Um, you can find these things oftentimes in different combinations or you'll find them in like, uh, there's products Paragon, Paracleanse, there's so many different um, companies that produce them. But the key is, is all these have been studied as being antimicrobial and for example, black walnut. Long, long history. And we're talking about black walnut um, holes. Um, 250 milligrams three times a day kills parasites. Now, the reason why you don't just pick one of these and go is because these work on different types of parasites in different ways. Uh, wormwood, also known as artesiamine, has been very well researched for parasite-caused cancers. Yes, cancers can be caused by parasites. So, wormwood has been very well researched, also known as artesiamine, in combination with oregano oil, black walnut, and clove, uh, which I don't believe I have on here, uh, combinations to destroy the majority of parasites. Grapefruit seed extract, especially with LaGuardia, um, the little small, little tiny ones you'll get like when you go to um, lakes and things like that when you ingest the water, or you know the water slide places, I mean, Lake Lopez, you know, it's a lake. And so you have animal species and things like that going in there. And, and yeah, I know it sounds gross, but it's just the way it is. Um, grapefruit seed extract kills the smaller antimicrobials. It also kills fungal and other forms of non-beneficial bacteria as well, too. Golden seal uh, fights infections in the digestive tract. Now, we think in terms of uh, golden seal most of the time when we get a, a cold or we get sick or that type of thing. But it is an excellent uh, in fighter of parasite, parasitical infections in, when they're located in the bowel. It's kind of funny, in the bowel, oftentimes what will happen with parasites is because people eat so much sugar, they get yeast. And these little yeast form like little trees in the bowel. So just picture little trees, boop, 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 poking holes in the bowel. All your food's leaking out of your bowel, causes, causes, causes something called leaky gut syndrome. And these little parasites, they just sit on the trees and they wait for the sugar and the white flour and they just make a nice little home and they multiply and they replicate. So, once again, getting rid of the sugar, stop feeding the yeast, the parasites will go. Now, when you try to kill these things off, they're not very happy. And so you will have a response and reaction to dying off, usually the second or third day, to doing any type of parasitical cleanse. Um, ginger uh, reduces some of the intestinal bloating and cramping. And if you've ever noticed when you eat sushi, there's always a little bit of ginger there. Please eat it. I don't care if you like it or not. Eat the ginger. It kills parasites, particularly those that are in fish. That's the reason why they put it there. It's not for taste. It's for, once again, the ounce of prevention. Um, peppermint 
can soothe it, also an antimicrobial. Now, when you do end up with particularly a bowel parasitical infection, it washes all your good bacteria and your good floras out because you're having diarrhea and blah, blah, blah. everything gets flushed out. So once we kill them all off, we got to replenish the good bacteria so they don't come back. So these good bacteria, which are also known as probiotics, establish the bacterial layers in your feet and feet of bowel and they, the immune system, the, your second brain is here and they consist primarily of these bacteria. And believe it or not, we have substantially more, and I believe Ralph had cited 10 times more bacteria, 10 bacteria for every cell we have in our body. So these beneficial bacteria are vital. So when you wash them out or, or destroy them with antibiotics, fluoride, all that wonderful stuff, uh, steroidals, certain other medications, what happens is, is your healthy cells, cells cannot stay healthy. These bacteria perform functions. And nobody should say, ah, I just do a yogurt today. Baloney. It would take you from the time Jesus was born in order to replace the amount of bacteria that you destroyed in one week of the amount of um, good bacteria that the antibiotic destroyed. So get a good high amount, 8 billion. So that would be equivalent to about 8,000 yogurts and just one pill. See my point? So it's very, very, very important that you get the good bacteria for recovery. Propolis, once again, in, in addition to grapefruit seed extract, fights Guardia, um, which once again is waterborne, which you're going to see kind of in Mexico or when you go out hiking and you dip into the beautiful clean stream. Yummy, yummy. Now you take along some grapefruit seed extract, a couple of drops, it'll kill it off. There, once again, is a way to prevent a lot of this. There are homeopathic remedies that can help you expel worms. And they work with the body's own natural um, ability to expel and identify friend from foe. These work in conjunction with the body, not against the body, as, as standard medical care oftentimes does. Now, if our food was in mint condition and of the finest, best quality, um, 75 years ago, we probably wouldn't be having this discussion about these bottom things. But And people's diet, they don't eat their eight servings of fruits and vegetables. Hey, I've already had six of them today, servings of fruits and vegetables, and I'm going to have a few more. The reason why is those cleansing fibers remove things out of the bowel. They keep things going so that you don't reabsorb those toxins back again and again, and your immune system drops. Good multiple vitamin, high in, I should say B vitamins and antioxidants, um, necessary nowadays because our food just doesn't cut it. Antioxidants, once again, help the body's immune system uh, recover uh, from the various um, environmental toxins and other things that we are exposed to on a daily basis. Ester C. Now, vitamin C and doctors are going, eh, I'm sorry, it is so well researched. C really bolsters the immune system and gives you a fighting chance. So if you can just do these basic, a good multiple high in antioxidants, C, make sure you're eating a lot of organic fruits and vegetables. And I stress organic because the others are full of chemical pesticides and chemical fertilizers. And guess what? They don't wash off, no matter how much they say to you. So your immune system and your liver has to process all of these chemicals. So what do you think is going to happen to your immune system while it's trying to process all these chemicals? Especially if you're vitamin C deficient. The liver won't function in a proper fashion. So um, I hate to tell you, but you're going to probably have to do the majority of these or a combination. So treatment of the parasites, recovery from the parasites, building the immune system, washing your produce, eating right. That's the combination to keep these things away. And if you suspect you have them, go get the testing. If that doesn't show and you still have the symptoms, you can do these parasite cleanses. Hope that helps you. Sorry to be so gross today. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today I'm going to show you a couple of exercises for the shoulder. Now, mind you, if you have any shoulder injuries or a torn rotator, 
please don't do these. And do them with light weight to start with. But if you want to have a nice uh, shoulder development and shoulder strength, because I got to tell you, as we grow older, this area weakens. And so to strengthen the muscle tissue, tendon, and ligament fibers, it's important that you exercise your shoulders. And I think a lot of women in particular don't. And so I think this is important to address. First of all, I want you to make sure you find a good chair that has a good back that supports your back and a little bit of weight. Now these are 15s, so I don't want you to go out and buy some 15s, but go out maybe and, and oh, grab a, a couple of cans of food or two or three pound weight. You're gonna have some back support here. And what we're gonna do, these are called Arnold presses after obviously our governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. What you do is you start with it in a frontal and mind you now my palms are towards my body and then I gradually raise up and I turn it and then I bring it back down. And see, if you can see my shoulder, it's completely involved with this motion, okay? Very safe because my back and my lower back are supported. And if you could try a couple of sets, that means um, how many different, um, like 12 repetitions would be considered a set. A couple of times a week, that would help tone. Now we also want to work on the front girdle, uh, the front portion of the shoulder, and that is going to take a stand-up mode. I don't usually suggest doing this seated. So you stand up with relatively lighter weight, and you can do this exercise in a couple of different ways, um, and it works the shoulder slightly different, but you're going to raise them. Do not raise them at the same time, otherwise you're going to throw your back forward, and we don't want to throw out the back. And we don't want a super heavy weight when we're doing this exercise. So you can do it with your palms down, or you can turn the weight this way, and you can do it with your palms towards each other. Okay? And probably about uh, two sets of 12 repetitions a couple of times a week in conjunction with the overhead will help you strengthen your shoulder. Next, we're going to be moving on to the wonderful research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for the intro. Well, kind of a breakthrough on multiple sclerosis, at least one that's not reported as of yet. And it came kind of out of the blue with a little bit of innovative research from Caltech researchers from the California Institute of Technology. What they discovered with multiple sclerosis, well, let's put it this way, they know multiple sclerosis was an autoimmune disease. And they noticed a little bit of a correlation when they had certain types of mice or animals that they were check checking for multiple sclerosis. They recognized when they put the mice or other sort of animals in a sterile environment, the multiple sclerosis seemed to go away. In addition to that, what happened was they noticed that generally that when certain individuals had viral infections and bacterial infections, the virus, or I should say multiple sclerosis, tended to get worse. So, what happened with the Caltech researchers said, said, well, that makes no sense because that's counterintuitive. Because the central nervous system is generally a sterile environment and bacteria shouldn't make a bit of difference. So, they said, let's just check it out and see what happens. Well, they took a couple of groups of mice, obviously, and they put them in a the sterile environment totally. And then what they did is they took a bacteria, which was called filamentarous bacteria, where it's like a microbe, it's usually found in the gut. And they reintroduced it into the system. Now what this bacteria did, unbeknownst to the researchers, or they should say they had an idea, it activated an inflammatory compound to multiple sclerosis called TH17. The reason TH17 is important because that's part of the immune system. And what it does, it activates an inflammatory response. The problem is with multiple sclerosis, if TH17 is activated and there's no infection to fight, it creates the autoimmune type of reaction. Well, what they did is they ran with this hunch. And basically they gave these mice that filamentarous bacteria. It's a gut bacteria. What happened was it did stimulate TH17, this inflammatory compound in the stomach. And then they wanted to test to see if it also inspired this TH17 inflammatory compound in the central nervous system. 
which again is the bane of people with multiple sclerosis? Well, to their surprise, it was yes on all counts. They drew the first connection which gut bacteria directly affects multiple sclerosis on all levels, which gave them the interesting hypothesis, which basically came down to, and they said, quote unquote, there is possible that maybe someday you can treat multiple sclerosis with probiotics to fight off these nasty bacteria. And I said, on, saying, quote unquote, to give them credit for the research, as we live cleaner, we're not just changing our exposure to infectious agents, but we're changing our relationship with the entire micro, uh, microbial world, can't pronounce it today, both around and inside us. And we may be altering the balance between pro and anti-inflammatory bacteria, the lead, research, the lead researchers from Caltech said. Perhaps treatments of diseases such as multiple sclerosis may someday include probiotic bacteria that can restore normal immune function in the gut and the brain. Very interesting research, something to start considering and looking at since probiotics tend to be fairly innocuous or not have any nasty side effects to them. I hope they pursue this research. It's really cool and multiple sclerosis at one time was a rare event now it seems like we all know, one, know someone with MS or has come down with MS. Wouldn't it be so cool if it's just something so incredibly simple? Well, let's see. All right, now what does, let's see, blueberries, green tea, some amino acids, and carnosine have in common? Well, they form this compound called NT-020. This is from the University of South Florida. Now, what does NT020 do? Well, it creates a proliferation of, blah, proliferation of stem cells in the brain, in the neurological system, in the bone, in other organs. Why is that important? Because they found that increased stem cell proliferation coincided with better cognitive performance. In addition to that, it increased, again, what, another word for it's called neurogenesis. Aging has been linked to oxidative stress, and they've previously shown that these natural compounds from blueberries, green tea, and amino acids such as carnosine are high in antioxidants and anti-inflammatories and have antioxidative activity, said the lead researchers. The combination of these nutrients, called NT-020, create a synergistic effect that promotes the proliferation of stem cells in aged animals which have the potential to develop into tissue and bone cells and also migrate to certain areas that are damaged and help with repair. What it also did in their quote was generally that the NT020 may not only have a positive effect on the stem cells, concluded the researchers, but NT020 may have far-reaching effects on organ function beyond the replacement of injured cells as demonstrated by cognitive improvement. What's the code word they're trying to say beyond that? Is reversal of aging. Again, simple stuff, N2020 is blueberries, green tea, carnosine, and basically just simple other amino acids. Something that anybody can get together at a regular health food store. Now another one, breast cancer. They looked at 1,500 women who use cleaning products. And this is a fast one. This is in the Access Journal of Environmental Health. The people who use the most cleaning products, guess what? They doubled the risk of breast cancer. There's a lot of variables that can go into just using cleaning, cleaning products itself. But however, it's something to think about. If you have a susceptibility to breast cancer, I'm not saying clean less, but really try to get cleaning products that may be as environmentally friendly and not only that, human friendly as possible. Because if you could double your chance of breast cancer just by cleaning, that's kind of unusual. All right. Also, now we go back to probiotics. Well, first with MS. Now for mothers. This is important, especially when it comes to skin diseases such as eczema. And this was basically published in the British Journal of Dermatology. They had shown when they gave mothers probiotic milk for at least 36 weeks prior to giving birth, they showed that generally this probiotic intake, just once per day, 
reduce their chance of the child developing eczema by 40% up to the age of two years of age. 40%, just one drink of probiotics, and that was it. In those that did come down with eczema, the eczema was much less severe than those in the placebo group that did not take any of the probiotic milk at all. Very simple probiotic, very common. All it did was called, it was called Lactobilis ramesis GG, otherwise known as LGG for short. If you have a propensity to eczema in the family, it's not a bad option. So DHA, probiotics, choline, and a decent prenatal go an extremely long way in having a healthy child. And as far as healthy child, ADHD. It came with the first conclusive link of the Western diet to behavioral disorders in children. This was done with 1,800 adolescents. And this was a long-term multi-center study that went over many years. What they looked at, and this was done from Perth Telethon Institute for Child Health. They found out that the Western diet, let's back that up. What's a Western diet and a healthy diet? A healthy diet to the researchers was one that contained fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and fish. I'm talking whole grains. Not the little grain they throw in this junk cereal and tell you, oh look, we have three grams of fiber in our sugar cereal. I'm not gonna mention any brand names. Compared to the Western diet, which was generally confectionery food, processed foods, and the like. Guess what? The Western diet was shown significantly, without a doubt, to contribute to ADHD. In fact, it doubled the risk of a child getting ADHD. This was a well done, well orchestrated study over many children. Now, however, though, the researchers concluded it may also be that Western dietary patterns doesn't provide enough essential micronutrients that are needed for brain function, particularly attention and concentration, or that a Western diet might contain more colors, flavors, and additives that have been linked to an increase in ADHD symptoms, or just the behaviors itself of the kids that pick up that junk food. So, if you have an opportunity, and you have a child with HDHD, you know what? Go to an organic food marker for a little bit. Eat a clean diet for a couple of weeks. What the heck? Beats a lifetime worth of medication. And to end it real fast, basically, watch your medications. They're adding a genetically modified sugar to a lot of the anti-inflammatories. It's not found in humans. And they discovered just the other day with the delta inert substance actually increases your inflammation dramatically. Ironically, this genetically modified sugar is also used in your anti-inflammatories. Well, thank you very much. Very I appreciate good. it. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you again for joining us. Do your research and eat a clean, good, organic diet. Thank you.